Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to revisit our 8x8 LED matrix. Now, last time when we left off, we said that, well, there's a way to sort of reduce the number of pins we can use to drive this particular component. And in fact, the solution is in using the shift register, something we've looked at previously in an episode I called Integrated Circuits. In fact, I've actually tried several different combinations of IC chips before I arrived at this one, which turns out to be you know, really simple and really cheap on the number of pins required. So yeah, we're gonna look at all these designs before delving deep into the actual good one. That's basically what we're gonna do in this Random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So the whole idea is we need to link up the IC chips somehow to the 8x8 LED matrix. Let's begin by exploring, you know, just several different configurations that I've tried. We will just briefly look at the first two because they are not, you know, quite as optimized. So yeah, this is the first idea I had. So we have our LED matrix and well, we still use 8 pins to actually scan either the rows or the columns. What we save on is by using a shift register and of course connecting that through resistors. Well. We just use three pins to basically control the eight outputs here. So yeah, what we get is a saving of five pins here. It's not so much of a great savings, but it is a start. And by sort of expanding upon this idea, we can eventually reach our highly optimized state. Of course, as you can imagine, there will be a little time penalty doing things this way because we will not be able to update all these pins in parallel. Instead, we're going to have to basically shift in the values one by one, serially. Moving on to our second idea, well, I wanted to use a chip I haven't shown you before. Um, this is called a decade counter. And well, this one actually just needs one data line. So what we've done is we've reduced our entire setup to four data lines. And that looks great, even though I've realized that there were some issues with this particular setup. Before we go there, however, let's take a look at the decade counter. Essentially, this is a chip with 10 outputs, and the two main inputs you need to think about are a clock pin and a reset pin. But the idea is all the inputs are low except the one that is currently selected. Let's say, well, the first one is selected, right? This one will be high. And basically, when a clock pulse is detected, we count. We move from one to the next, and this one goes high, the first one goes low. Basically, as the clock pulses change, each one of the outputs get raised to high in turn. And that is essentially how we sort of create the idea of a counter. To make this more concrete, let's take a look at, well, video of this actually in action, and you'll get a better idea. So all right, basically this is my decade counter setup. Now I have everything well connected accordingly, so essentially what I have is, well, the chip in the center, right, all the pins wired up, but actually none of them coming from the Arduino itself. The only thing I can control is control with this switch right here, and this controls the clock going to the chip. Technically, every button press will sort of forward the internal state of the counter. Now, as you can see, the outputs are kind of all over the place, right? That's just, you know, a problem, or should I say just how the schematic is designed. So don't worry too much about that. But the point is, by just using one input, you are able to sort of move an internal state that will basically influence, you know, the output on the chip itself. As you can imagine, this would be extremely useful if we're gonna be doing something like scanning for the LED matrix. Of course, there is one problem. There are 10 outputs here, but the LED matrix only needs eight of them. So we actually have to ignore two. So, in order to resolve this, I've actually made one wiring change here. This is actually the reset pin. And what I've done is I've wired it to output number 8, which, well, normally would be represented by this LED. Now, notice what happens. Basically, as I go through my 8 outputs, you know, the moment I hit that one, well, it basically resets over. So what you find is that the last two outputs, namely 8 and 9, you know, these two blue ones, they no longer light up because, well, the internal state is reset before it gets over to them. 
So yeah, that is basically one easy sort of electrical way to work around the problem of there being 10 outputs. Am I proud of myself for that solution? Yes, yes I am. Is it a great solution? I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's a little bit hacky, but well, it does the job and I'm sure you know, that is one way of doing it. And what that means is at face value, we have reduced our 16 wires down to just four. Three to power our shift register, which we are of course still using in this setup, and just one to work with our decade counter. Unfortunately, there are some problems with this setup, and that is the decade counter needs to start at zero, but it's not something we can enforce. You see, the way the whole scanning thing works is that we have to put out you know, the zeroth row of contents through the shift register while the zero line is basically being scanned when it's basically ready to display. However, we don't know where the decay counter is. If we have reset you know, the whole setup at one point of time or another, the shift register will reset from zero, but the decay counter will not. And what happens is, well, you end up with a picture that has, well, the rows in the wrong order. To work around this problem, we can use an additional data pin by connecting our reset pin to the Arduino. What this means is unfortunately, well, we're using five pins now. Not great. Finally, we can come down to look at our most optimized solution, which surprisingly makes use of just two shift registers. In order to achieve this, we actually take a look at a pin that we've not really used before, and that is a pin for chaining. In order to understand how this works, we are going to have to go back to you know, the diagram that sort of explains how a shift register works in the first place. Of course, basically just think of it as a bunch of D flip-flops that share a single clock signal. Whatever data you have gets pushed forwards from one D flip-flop to the other, you know, based on a clock pulse, until it eventually pops out at the end. Now, whatever that comes out at the end doesn't just go to waste, it actually goes to that last pin, the chain pin over here. What we can actually do is to make use of this output to feed a second shift register, like so. Now, all we have to do is to actually connect this output to the data pin of our second shift register. That way, whatever that is coming out of this first chip actually goes into the second chip and basically spends another eight cycles going through the second shift register. In terms of connection to the Arduino itself, well, we of course need to use our same three pins to feed our first shift register. However, we basically share the shift and store clock pins to the second register. And what this means is these two ICs will always act in sync. Whenever we say shift, everything will move within the first shift register, the last item will pop out and feed the second shift register, while everything here also moves. That way, you get a very seamless experience between these two. Of course, don't forget about power. And yeah, basically, this will be our final setup. All we have to do now is to just hook that up to our LED matrix. And what we've basically created here is the ability to power a 16-pin LED matrix using just three pins on our Arduino. Let's now jump into the actual circuit itself well, this is as clear as it gets, but we will try and build it, as well as to write the code we need to power up this matrix and have it show whatever we want it to show. So let's take a look at the circuit hardware itself. Obviously really neat, you know, not confusing at all. Yeah, no, let's stick to the pictures. So this is a representation of our shift register. Not too much to really worry about, Probably the only thing you need to take note is that there are several pins that we don't normally talk about, namely the enable and reset pins. These actually have to be connected, otherwise you know the chip won't work properly, and that is just one of the reasons why the whole connection can look quite messy. Notice that these guys have that little line above their names, and what that means is, in order to get the functionality that is listed here, you will need to bring that line down to low. That is the reason why this pin goes low because we want it enabled, but this one is high because we don't want to keep resetting our chip. So yeah, just something to take note of 
This is the pinout of the chip itself. Let's now take a look at how we are going to connect everything up. Firstly, of course, well, the pins coming from your Arduino will feed the two chips as we've described earlier. Of course, note that this is our first chip. The second chip is on the left, which is why the output from the first chip is being chained to the one on the left. Of course, these will have to feed the display itself like so. Our first chip is actually supplying the rows. In other words, this is the one that is doing the scanning. Only one of these pins will be high at any point of time. This then goes out through the columns, through a series of resistors, back to our second chip. So this chip is the one that, you know, has all the varying values, allowing us to draw out the individual contents of every single line. So yeah, hopefully this picture shows you how the circuit is actually completed. This arrow here is showing, you know, the flow of current. That is how it's supposed to go. This chip will act as a sink. So all right, with that said, we can now proceed to the code itself. Of course, we always start off by, well, defining our actual pins. Remember, on the Arduino itself, we only need to make use of three pins. So we define them here. And in our setup function, we have to set all these to outputs. Now, we will also need to pause our store pin later on. So let's write a function to do that for us. We will create a little fingerprint all the way at the top of our page of code. And this is the implementation itself. All we are doing here is raising the store pin to high, waiting a little while, and then dropping it down back to low. This of course is how we give that pin a little pause, just for a very short amount of time. Now, before we continue doing anything else, let's test our setup to make sure it's working correctly. What I'm doing here is I'm making use of two shift out statements. Firstly, to shift out a zero, and then again, to shift out just, you know, a one on every bit. Once we have that, we pulse the store clock, pushing everything towards the output. But what do these two statements really mean? Let's go back to the diagram, we'll try to understand it here. Firstly, don't forget that this chip is the first in line to receive anything coming from the Arduino itself, and this is the second. So what that means is, the first thing we actually send out will go through this chip and bubble its way out of this chip into the second one. In other words, the zero, you know, the first thing that we've written, goes here. The second thing we push through will stay on the first chip. So zero comes out here, 255 comes out here. And what we really get is, well, all our rows are high, all our columns are low. In other words, every single LED should light up. If you do not see any LEDs, you know, switched on over here, say if you have any rows or columns missing, what this means is you've probably connected something incorrectly. At this point of time, there probably isn't anywhere for your code to go wrong, so check your physical connections. If you have everything switched on like this, you're good to go. So let's actually, you know, draw our usual little smiley face. What I have here is an array containing the actual information to display, represented as numbers. Now, what do these numbers really mean? You see, all I've done is I've taken every single row's worth of bits and converted them to a decimal representation. This, of course, is the little smiley face we want to plot out. So yeah, we just use our zeros and ones, we get a decimal representation, and we stick that in an array form, like so. In our actual loop, we can then continuously access that array to pull out the relevant bytes, while of course making sure that the corresponding row is actually being set high. Now, let's take a closer look in case you're not too, you know, used to this particular notation here. The idea is what we're trying to do is a bit shifting operation, which allows us to select one particular row. You see, 128 is actually this particular bit string. Just one byte raised to high, and it is the leftmost one. Of course, when it comes to rows, what this means is we are trying to set the topmost row to a high state, while the rest of the rows are low. By shifting this any number of positions, what you're doing is you're moving that to a subsequent row. For example, in this case, we're shifting it just by one position. So now the second row gets put to the high state, while everything else is low. 
On a similar vein, by just putting any number here, we can set the corresponding row to height. So yeah, essentially that is what's being populated onto these two chips. Right, don't forget that the first value goes off to the second chip in charge of the columns, and the second value goes into our first chip. This will be what handles the scanning process. So we should have everything working just fine, right? Well, as it turns out, something weird happens here, and that is our image actually becomes inverted. Now, this may seem a bit strange, but really it shouldn't surprise you. What we are sending out, you know, on our second chip is one when we want a particular LED to be lit. However, don't forget that these are the columns. We want to use these pins as sinks, so they have to go low where we want an LED to light up. What this means is realistically in our array, we're going to have to actually flip the values around. When we want a pixel to not light up, it needs to become 1. And when it's 0, the corresponding pixel will light up. Thankfully, there is an operator that can help us do that, and that is the tilde operator. What this does for you is it simply flips every single bit within a number, which is exactly what we're looking for. By just making this one little change here, we should get the result we are expecting, and that is of course our little smiley face. In fact, why stop there? What I have here is yet another one of these shift registers as well as another LED matrix, Turns out you can do the exact same thing. What I've done here is I've powered double the amount of LEDs using just the same three data pins. Instead of shifting out twice, I now have to shift out three times, you know, to get a third byte out there. And these will represent the columns for both LED matrices, as well as the rows, which are scanned together as one. Basically for the scanning part, all I've done is just I've doubled up the connections to, you know, my row shift register. And what this means of course is that they are just sharing the same values and, you know, there's no problem with that. So there you go, that has been my little optimization. I've tried very hard to reduce the number of pins and I think 3 is going to be as low as it gets. That has been using an 8x8 LED matrix alongside, you know, our shift registers as well as a decade counter which unfortunately didn't work as I hoped. But yeah, at the end of the day, well, the results were not too bad, I think. That's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you gained some insight today. But until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.